So, hello everyone and welcome to the October 2022 edition of Fiction Fix Online. This event is being live streamed to the video on, sorry, the finger on the pulse, the Facebook group for Fiction Fix Online and the Zoom video will be posted afterwards on my Helen Claire Gould channel on YouTube. So please subscribe and please point all your friends to it. And if you wish to join the finger on the pulse, you can ask me to, do, to let you in or uh, message me on Facebook to ask for an invitation. There are a few view, uh, rules to review um, and some questions to answer, but the group is for both readers and listeners. And at our Fiction Fix Live events, um, we used to have a books table. Now we can't do that with Fiction Fix Online, but authors reading this afternoon, please post your book details in the chat and I will pick them up later and post them um, with uh, the video on, and the, uh, on, uh, um, in the finger on the pulse and on uh, you, my YouTube channel. Um, include your website. Uh, if you have a link to the ebook and the seller for the print version, anything like that, uh, you can include prices, an ISBN or a SIN if you have it. And on Amazon Kindle, um, usually what happens is, uh, thank you, David, <laughs> is that um, uh, the ASIN just takes people straight to the book. This can be done at the end or at any time during the show while you're not reading. And I will post all the details um, or in the um, comments below as appropriate. So. Um, so today we've got four guest readers returning and one new reader. And it just so happens that all our female writers are from the um, UK. Brilliant, that's a fantastic start with the book details. Um, our male authors include two US-based uh, writers and one UK writer, our newest recruit. So now please unmute everyone. And let's join our first author as she takes us exploring the dark side of life. So to get us going this afternoon, we'll start with a reading from Chico. Uh, Chico, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, who writes as Chico Kid, which is her, her name, I believe. Um, Indeed it is. Yes. So this isn't her first appearance at Fiction Fix. Um, at the Bull Hotel um, in... Um, 2017, uh, Peterborough actually hosted a fantasy con, and the last event that weekend was a blockbuster. It was huge, wasn't it? Because there was about a dozen writers. Sunday yeah. evening edition of Fiction Fix at the Draper's Arms, and Chico was one of about a dozen writers to appear that evening, and it went down really well. So please make some noise for Chico Kid and Resurrection, which Chico is soon to have finished publishing. So. Okay, here goes. <clears throat> Andrew Flores calls himself a student of magic, sneered the Venetian. I raised one eyebrow. My employer dabbled in that sort of thing, more than dabbled as I knew to my cost. But from the books he'd had me collecting over the years, he must have had a pretty exhaustive knowledge of it by now, or at least a well-stocked library. He drained his wine glass and put it down on the desk, tapped his nail on the rim to make it chime. No such animal, unless you're too damned lily-livered to try, which this fellow appears to be. So he won't turn me into a toad, I said dryly. See, my employer jabbed a finger at me and smiled nastily. I told you you wouldn't need to kill him. Maybe not. But when I got to Ceylon, getting hold of this grimoire or whatever it was, proved more difficult than I'd expected. There wasn't a thief in Colombo who'd go anywhere near the man's house. And I wasn't about to start a new career as a burglar. No, stick to being right-hand man to the biggest crook in the Veneto, De Silva, I said to myself. That'll keep you on the good side of the constabulary. Not that they were ever able to pin anything on me. I was too bloody careful. In Venice, all I'd have needed to do was drop a word to the reluctant book collector I'd have had the damn tome in my hands before you could say kneecap. A few thousand miles away, my presence wasn't a threat to anybody. 
As it turned out, though, I didn't need to waste time quizzing a bunch of assorted charlatans, table turners and conjurers. The man was the subject of good, honest gossip all over town in what passed for polite society, as well among, as among the riffraff. Where there's gossip, there's potential for persuasion. Oh, all right, I won't mince words. I mean blackmail. Andrew Flourish was a weak-faced man with prominent ears, but not much in the way of chin, and without the courage God gave a rabbit. He stared at me, the way they say rabbits get transfixed by predators summoned up some nervous self-righteousness and huffed. Captain de Silva, I told your employer, I won't tell him the book. He had one of those overbred English voices. It went perfectly with the lack of chin. And frankly, I resent having some bloody foreigner foisted on me. He's sending someone to try and change my mind as if I were a child to be persuaded of the error of my ways. Ooh, defiance. I stared him down. It wasn't difficult. He fiddled with a small paper knife on his desk. I didn't think he was going to try and stab me with it. See, there's the difficulty, I said softly, leaning over the desk towards him so that he flinched back. What difficulty? He blurted out. You thinking we would change your mind, I told him with a smile. He eyed me worriedly. Do you mind if I smoke? No, no, go ahead. I found my shirts and lit up made myself comfortable in the chair. Although comfortable is a relative word. It was damnably humid, even if not tremendously hot. All my clothes were damp and most of them were sticking to me. I hear you're going to be married, I remarked conversationally. Thought, thought though Flores sorry, <coughs> blinked at the change of topic. Does she know, I went on, but he interrupted me in a sort of cross triumph, that I study magic, yes. I smiled again and blew smoke at him. Would it have been nice to achieve a smoke ring with that and that guy never managed to muster? I was going to say about your mistress, I went on. He blanched. But do Miss Jeffrey's parents know what else you do in your spare time? That was a complete shot in the dark, I admit. But if a man has one secret, or in Flourish's case, two, chances are there'll be another deeper one. You bastard, he said, almost too quiet to hear. Mistake, I heard the drawer slide open, was over the desk in a second, slamming it shut on his hand, heard something crack. He doubled over the desk, swearing, tears of pain running out of his eyes. I pushed him back into his chair and opened the drawer. Here, yeah, there was a gun in it. I shook my head. The Englishman looked at the revolver fearfully as I lifted it out and unloaded it, dropped the bullets back into the drawer and closed it, put the gun on the blotter sat down again on the other side of the desk, smiled. Don't go for it if you aren't prepared to use it, I advised him. Clutching his hand, he muttered, I was. No, I don't think so. Come on, I said, getting impatient. It's only a book, for God's sake. The rabbit almost grew fangs for a split second. It was never only a book, damn it. Don't you even know what Delacrasia wants? I shrugged. Took a drag from my shroud. Power is what he wants. Flourish laughed as if it hurt him. What is it he wants to find, he asked bitterly. Spells only give heart's desire at a price. He should know that. I don't really care what he does, I said. It would be nice if it killed him, though. Why I added that, I don't quite know. I thought it all the time. But saying it, going soft in the head, Silver, Flourish stared at me intently. Who are you? he inquired. Captain of the Isabella, I answered. Thank you. Wow, that's fabulous. Thank you. So please unmute yourself now and let's put all our hands to work for Chica Kid and Resurrection. Thanks, Chico. Right now. We welcome back all the way from the USA, Chuck. And he had to get up early as well. So have you had breakfast, Chuck? Not really yet. It's a little early for that still. <laughs> it's 8 a.m. over here. So <laughs> yeah. So please, a big hand for Andrew Sweet reading from his latest science fiction novel, 
Southern Highlands. Thank you all so much for muting yourselves during the reading. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll begin. There's a little bit of setup here. April has just found out that our loads from Mars, she's uh, manages trade with Mars and that our loads from Mars are coming back light. And the people she answers to are interested in finding out why. <clears throat> All right, by my count, and Duna and Eudora explained, your questionable loads were less than 50% of capacity. Were you thinking to buffer 30% or more each shipment? That would decimate our supply chains. Airpool shook her head. That was only an explanation, Duna. Of course, we would never do that without consulting the United, with United Africa first. 15% was done without our consent. Whether it was the years of isolation aboard the docking station or the fact that she had many other more important things to do, like actually work on solving the problem that the Anduna wanted her to investigate, April's patience wore thin. Anduna Eudora, I must remind you that the Southern Highlands Trading Company operates with autonomy in trade. This protects United Africa from liability and many of the more risky trading scenarios. 15% is what we thought best to protect United Africa. And so we set that threshold when I arrived here at the station. Our uninterrupted trade to date and good health of United Africa's trading supplies proved the effectiveness of that decision. April didn't dare look at it, it look to Induna Bonki, who she expected would chastise her for the way she'd cut into Induna Eudora. Induna Eudora drew her head back quickly, and her body followed suit, shuffling backward at the rebuke. April could feel the embarrassed hostility emanating outward like radiation poisoning the air between them. But through her peripheral vision, she also saw something that looked like a smirk on Anduna Obonki's face by, before he cleared his throat. Anduna Eudora, shall we stay focused on the problem at hand? With those words, Anduna Eudora straightened herself and her face went back to placid emptiness. So let's discuss the cause of, latest late, of the latest shipments then, she said, her tone letting April know that if there was anything at all she could find in those shipment failures to hold April accountable, she would. April sucked in her breath. We don't know anything yet, she admitted, fighting the urge to close her eyes and turn away. You had several hours to investigate, and you found nothing? Our liaison on the surface appears to be missing, or at least not returning our Ansible calls. We've heard there's fighting in Tharsis, but we don't know more than that at the moment. And Duna Scarlet chime, chimed in. There's more fighting. There's more than fighting, she said. April turned her attention to the woman, who was more heavy set than she and taller. The woman could have been a wrestler if it were a guest by her build. The Southern Highlands are the ones fighting with Tharsis. From what we can tell, they're winning as well. And nobody told us. You didn't need to know until now. And frankly, we thought you knew already. April turned her head downward, aware that what Anduna Scarlet had just reminded her was that the Anduna were aware of her past relationship with Jean. Anduna Scarlet continued, have you reached out to Lu Jean directly? It seems like a reasonable thing to do, given that he's far likely to win at Tharsis and eliminate a significant competitor. Are you sure he's winning, Induna? Induna Scarlet nodded as her long black curls swung back and forth across her face. April bit her lip, wondering what else they'd kept from her. If he's winning, then he's probably trying to leverage his new position. Have the Induna any additional information that may help inform the company? Of the main warlords, Mars is now down to two. The other... 30 or so barely matter, and you know all about their favorite settler playthings in the far south. Also, Liu Jian has been working his own trade routes with Ganymede, and that would be an even more enticing offer if he has an option for Martian trade, or if he is the only option for Martian trade. Cutting us out? You think he's going independent? We think he has a, no, we think he has a plan, but we're not sure what it might be, said Aduna and Bonke. One thing is certain. He is expanding trade with other colonies, which is against United African law. Global law, April corrected, then closed her mouth quickly as she realized that she let her familiarity with Induna Obonki overpower her professionalism. He waved her comment away with a swiping motion of his hand. Same thing. He knows, as do all of our colonies, that the raw goods must be shipped back to Earth for refinement, and the United Af Africa S Southern Highlands Company is how that happens. Our concern at the moment is that if he continues to consolidate power, then what? April had no answer to that question. The light holes probably mean that Lu Jun wants to renegotiate the contract. That's all, she responded, rolling her arms back to feel the crack in her shoulder blades. That may be the extent of it. He's not a complicated man. I'll call him. 
Nduna Monkey's eyebrows shot together with that statement, flashing an inquisitive glance. She tried to return the look that conveyed the message that she had everything under control. Negotiation wouldn't be as simple as she implied. She hoped that her aging mentor trusted her enough to keep her secret. He seemed to say he was about to interject something when Indula Scarlet interrupted. No, some people can't be reasoned with. The only thing he understands is force. You're dismissed, Miss Sello. After the meeting closed, April wiped a bead of sweat from her face to find that the strands of her hair had stuck to her cheek. She shoved the strands away and took a deep, full breath, then exhaled, pushing out with her stomach, forcing her limbic system to bring in something like relaxation. A few seconds later, she focused on John's Ansible address and reached out with her mind. A frictionless, automated voice told her that the call would be connected as audio only because of the distance. When the call finally did connect, it wasn't Lou's voice that came over the phone or came over the line. Greetings, came a man's annoying chipper. Annoyingly chipper voice. This is, this is April Salo of the Southern Highlands Trading Company. Do you know why I'm calling? And Zilu suggested you might contact us. I was told to inform you that Hesperia Planum has joined our trading block. Enzi, when did that happen? Enzi was an ancient word meaning leader of the people, something akin to emperor. The man didn't respond and only rattled on. Hesperia Planum, what about Tharsis? Tharsis, what about Tharsis? The Southern Highlands Trading Company doesn't trade on what they mine over there, but I could check with Enzi and see if it doesn't matter. Why are our boats coming back light? The Hesperia effort was more expensive than we'd expected. Cow was more entrenched than we thought. Enzi Lu said to reassure you that the loads will be balanced soon. April picked up immediately on the fact that the man said was instead of is about Hesperia's leader. We had a deal. How does Enzi expect us to make money when we can't predict what's in our shipments? She already hated that stupid title and bared her teeth every time she had to repeat it. With more funds, we can meet your expectations all the time. Now that Hesperia is on board, this, the instability is over, but we do need to rebuild and there are other warlords who aren't yet convinced of our victory. It came down to money. This is a renegotiation after all. How much? Double. Uh, explicit language, I forgot to mention earlier. <laughs> Fuck you. There were complications during negotiations. Cal is gone, sadly, and Lance has been installed. With all the work we still have to do, it's going to take a while. We need to import some things. Enzi said, tell Enzi that maybe we'll deal with someone else instead. She thought she heard the man scoff. There is no one else. Not here on Mars, anyway. We're the one-stop shop for Martian goods. Enzi has it authorized me to go as low as 1.5 times current rate. Fine. Fine. Send me the docs so legal can review. On their way, on their way, Masalo. Anything else? With a snarl of disgust, snarl of disgust, she disconnected, and awaited the arrival of the contract, only to realize when she got it that with the fine print, Lou had written out any had been written out of any liability for failing to deliver. She forwarded it to legal, forwarded it to legal, and contracts for review, but had little hope of reconciliation. Whatever Lou Jean wanted, it wasn't to restore trade. You know, stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Um, right. So please do unmute yourselves and let's hear it again for Andrew Sweet and Southern Highlands. That's his latest book. Okay. So our next guest, re guest reader, it won't work today. Our next guest reader is David. Now, he's been in the studio audience a couple of times, but he's a new guest reader and he has various novels out, but he's going to read an extract from his comic cosy mystery novel. So let's have a warm welcome for David Wake as he reads an extract from The Murders of Conky Wallop, which sounds very intriguing. Please mute yourself down during the reading. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it is for my latest novel and I do need to do some explanation for it. Um, you're always told when writing a crime fiction that you should have a body on page one. So this is uh, chapter one, which is called A Body on Page One. It was a dark and stormy night. It's just terrible, Annabelle said wringing her hands to see if there was any more anguish to squeeze out. She was the youngest of three friends, barely into her free bus pass, 
and dressed stylishly in an outfit popular on over 50s dating apps. Yes, dear, Pat said. Her half moon glasses magnified the twinkle in her eye and the Times crossword. But the parish magazine has been printed, printed for nearly 175 years. The lightning flashed outside. Come flood, storm, war, or even the great Hornet invasion. Such had been the news that the two friends had started on the muffins. Thunder pealed and the doorbell rang. That'll be Diane, Pat said. Diane stood outside in the rain and thunder raged in her eyes. Di, come in, come in, Pat said, before you catch your death. Diane wiped her Wellingtons on the welcome mat then slipped them off to come into Pat's drawing room. She wore sensible everything, except for a couple of loops of pearls, and she had a reputation as a battle axe treading the boards of amateur theatre, the boardrooms of local government, and the boards put out over muddy fields at protests. The vicar, Diane said. Now, now, Di, we must be understanding, Pat said. The vicar, yes, yes, but he may have a point. After all, everything is being connected to the internet, 5G ups and all that. The vicar's dead, Diane said. Well, that's a little strong, Pat said. It's only a parish magazine. I'm sure you can settle your differences, Annabel said. I mean, he's the vicar. We have to talk to him on Sundays at the very least. He's dead, Diane insisted. Knifed in the back. But it, it is a kind of betrayal to turn the parish magazine into a blog. Is it blog, Pat said? I'm sure that can't be a word, but perhaps in cryptic, but not in Scrabble. Pat, Bell, listen. The vicar is lying in the church with a knife in his back. A dreadful silence filled the room, except for the hammering of the rain outside, the rolling thunder and the wearing of Pat's old fridge. Whatever's he doing that for? Annabel said. Pat, Diane said. A second opinion, please. Pat glanced at the paisley curtains, so thick and capable of keeping out the cold and uproar. On a night like this? Diane nodded. So, the three old ladies donned their coats and rain hats, crossed the lane and then struggled up the hill to the church. A path led through the graveyard to the porch. The sky flashed as Diane pushed open the heavy oak door, but they didn't hear it creak as the thunder chose that moment to roar. Inside, in the dark, they found the remembrance candles and Diane struck a match to light one for each of them. The flames cast vast shadows and the darkness skulked about as they crept down the aisle. Under the reproachful gaze of stone angels and stained glass saints, the quiet hung heavy. I was giving him a piece of my mind, Diane started explaining, about, well, everything. The parish magazine, guitars instead of the organ, and the nonsense with Mrs. Entwistle's flower arranging. It's all change, change, change. Well, quite. When? Diane trailed off until even the echoes were quiet. When? Pat prompted. When I realised he wasn't listening. <gasps> Typical man, Annabelle said. So I tapped him on the shoulder and he fell there. Oh, how rude. They rounded the front pew and there was no more need for explanation. Beneath the eagle gaze of the lectern, the vicar lay sprawled on the tiled floor, his bald head reflecting the warm glow of their remembrance candlelight. An ornate knife stuck out of his back. Vicar, that tried, no answer. She bent down and reluctantly felt the fallen man's neck. There's no pulse. Oh God, Annabelle said. Oh, sorry, Lord. My hands are too cold to tell, really, Pat explained. I'll, I'll turn him over. However, one-handed, Pat wasn't strong enough. Annabelle took Pat's candle from her, and then two-handed, Pat still wasn't able to manage it. So Diane helped. And three-handed, the vicar rose gently and, rode, and rolled onto his side. The Reverend Pendletook's eyes stared wide blank and full of disapproval. He's dead, Pat decided. Diane began to let go. Wait, Pat said. There's something caught underneath. What is it? Diane asked. A piece of paper, Pat said. She tugged gently, teasing it free. This is a terrible accident, Annabelle said. If only he'd let Mrs. Rawlings polish the silver. She's slow but careful. The Reverend didn't know how to do it properly, so the knife probably slipped. I doubt it slipped, Val, Diane said. It's not an accident. 
Suicide, Annabel said. Oh, how terrible. Is that his suicide note? It's not suicide, Belle, Diane said. <gasps> a bit more, Pat said. They rolled him further, but the sheet of A4 wouldn't quite slide out. Then the oversized fancy handle sticking out of his back caught on the tarred floor and he turned no more. His body held the last corner of the paper, so it tore when it came free. They let go. The thicker rolled back into the recovery position from which he was never going to recover. Well, Diane asked. Yes, Annabel said, what is it? Pat held the sheet of paper up to the feeble candlelight. It was blank on one side and steeped in blood. But the other side had that familiar line drawing of, drawing of the church over the title banner. It's from the parish magazine, Pat said. He was lying on page one. Du, du, du. <laughs> Are you stopping there then, David? Mm. Indeed, that's the end of chapter one. Fabulous. So uh, please unmute yourselves now and show your appreciation for David Wake and the murders of Conky Wallop. Have I got that right? Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> okay, so uh, and now Marie's returns with the last in her current series. Um, and uh, could you please make some noise for Marie's Moreland with her science fiction tale, The Resonance War, and many thanks for muting yourselves during the reading. So come on, Marie's, let's hear what you got to tell us. Okay, uh, now uh, this uh, extract features Talion, who is half Celestrian, half Novellan, and he longs to see life beyond the settlement of New Narvella, where he's grown up. He decides to steal a spacecraft and go to Celestra in search of his father, but he doesn't actually know where Celestra is. Talion's journey wasn't as random as it might have been. Although he didn't know Celestra's location, he had some fairly good clues. He knew, for instance, exactly where old Narvella was, near the edge of the galaxy's spiral arm, in an area where stars were few and scattered. He also knew that a thousand light years separated its faltering star and Celestra's sun order, and that order lay in an area replete with stars. Therefore, he had restricted his search to the center of the galactic arm adjacent to old Narvella's position. Next, he had excluded everything but yellow-white dwarf stars with planets. That would hopefully cut the odds by at least 50%. Now he wasn't so sure. Planets. He'd never imagined there'd be so many. At first, he'd tried to maintain a sensible sleep cycle, but as the enormity of his task dawned on him, he'd spent every possible moment hanging hollow-eyed over the logic system, checking and rechecking the transposer modes for any sign of communication, searching in vain for star drive markers. His food supply was two thirds gone. The atmosphere had been filtered so many times that impurities were beginning to creep in. And he didn't dare think about the recycled water, which he was doing his best to ration. His clothes were in need of a real wash instead of the particle scrub, which left a build up of sweat. And this was after barely a season. Sooner rather than later, he'd have to make landfall. Sighing, he resigned himself to staying out of transposal even longer than he had been, searching for planets with water and a breathable atmosphere. He wasn't surprised at the number of arid rocks he encountered. Then his luck appeared to change. The permanently vigilant radio, which he'd programmed to ignore cosmic static and pulsars, locked onto a new signal source, intermittent, unintelligible, but an unmistakable sign of civilization. The system of origin was 75 light years distant in a region he had almost missed as being outside of his parameters. Hopeful for the first time since his journey started, he engaged the drive and, during the brief interval of transposal, went to have a much needed shower. When he emerged, viewed the blue planet of his destination and heard the brash miscellany of its broadcasts, 
he was in no doubt where he was headed. This was the world Edenion had dared to visit, Earth, which meant Celestia must, have, must be within a day's transposal, but in what direction? He checked yet again for markers and transmissions, and instead of the usual negative result, detected a solitary active transposer. Then suddenly he was in trouble. The transposed mo message was from Earth. He heard a voice say, Celestia. Then the communications panel erupted in a cascade failure. The logic system fold and the lights died, leaving him in smoke-filled darkness. Chivani Manor, 5th of September, 2011. Is it working, Frank? Well, why don't you say something to our celestial friends? Me? I'd sound like a prat. This was your idea, Bartlett, so you do it. Or shall we ask Rogan? I'm not sure that's wise. Didn't anyone write a speech? Give me the microphone, said Sir John. Then, after a moment to compose himself, began, this is Chivani Manor, England, calling Celestra. We know you understand this language. We wish to speak with your first citizens on a ma matter of political sensitivity. Please respond. Everyone waited. Then a faint odor of burning rose from the makeshift transmitter. Frank cut the power and cautiously cautiously opened the side to reveal an array of blackened and useless crystals. Nice one, Frank, said Talitha. I don't know why it did that, Frank said lamely. Do you think they heard us? If they did, they know where we are, said Sir John calmly. Replace your crystals, Frank, and we'll try again later. In the meantime, I recommend patience and vigilance. With the air purifiers at maximum, Talion laboured to make repairs under the insufficient glow of an emergency light bar. He had taken interchangeable circuit cards from the refrigeration unit, the music player, and after some deliberation, the hygiene cubicle. It was imperative to restore full function to the transposer and logic systems in order to study what had happened. Just before the power failed, something very odd had appeared on the monitor, something to do with that message. He only hoped it was retrievable. This is weird, he murmured aloud. The message wasn't intended for me, so why did I hear even a bit of it? Transposers don't work like that. Had the signal reached Zestra? Unlikely. There'd been too much degradation in the content, but the transposer beam itself and its target encode had probably fared better. He was counting on that. At last, with power restored, he coaxed the logic system into grudging response and then stared in bewilderment. It was as if someone had mapped every active order site source in the quadrant and then joined up the dots. His spacecraft was one such source. No wonder everything had sorted out. The energy surge must have been colossal. But whatever it was, it had gone and he had his information. Not only the correct encode for Celestia, but its location as well. Elated, he programmed the drive. His joy was short-lived. There was a keening sound from somewhere under the floor and the sphere shook a little. The drive failed to engage. Talion cursed himself for not realizing that all the onboard systems could have been damaged by the surge, not just the ones under his nose. Hardly daring to look, he unfastened a panel beneath the guidance controls and peered at the auxiliary array. Three of the power nodes were unlit, leaving five. This, like the drive, was beyond his ability to repair. With those power levels, he might make landfall, but nothing further. Behind him, the transposer gave a peremptory beep. Disbelievingly, he scrambled back to the diagnostic screen, which foretold the imminent failure of several more crystals, the ones he'd just replaced. No, 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 he yelled. The cabin's dead acoustics took his cry and stifled it. Hastily, he copied that day's flight log onto a file, added a few hurried sentences in his own voice, and transposed the file as a data burst. He briefly glimpsed an auto-response from the Celestrian receiving station before the screen sputtered out. He glanced at the still open thruster array. One of the five nodes was flickering. So what's next on the malfunction list? He asked himself. Life support, hull integrity, you're out of options, Talion. Stop dithering and land this death trap. 
you can do it. The sphere hurtled earthwards toward Chivani Manor. Thank you. Okay, so please unmute yourselves now and let's have a big hand for Marie's Moorland and the resonance wall. <clears throat> Lovely. Okay. So our other reader from the USA today is Dale. And Dale has got a new book out. So many thanks for muting yourselves during the reading. And please put your hands together for Dale Lehman as he reads from his latest thriller, A Day for Bones. Thank you. Um, in case you're wondering what it looks like, it looks like this. And this is volume four of my Howard County mystery series. Um, one note, I, I've uh, entered a day for bones in the uh, Publishers Weekly's um, Book Life Award contest. Um, we're still waiting. Uh, there's a couple, about two weeks left for the initial round of judging to complete. But at this point, I am in line for the quarterfinals. Um, they gave it a 9.25 out of 10. I'm very pleased with that. I've been told that this is my best novel so far, and uh, that appears to be the case from uh, the judge's point of view. So um, I'm going to read from the first chapter. There are two scenes that I'm reading. The first scene is relatively short. The second scene is long, so I'm actually only going to read a portion of the second scene. When I stop, there is more to come. Helpless, he watched from his second floor living room window above the bakery. Water surged down Main Street below, hurling branches and wreckage and even cars through the darkness. Mother Nature, the most efficient of brooms in hand, was sweeping the town clean. A strange phrase, he thought, sweeping clean. A friend's grandmother had once spoken in those terms. The 1937 Ohio River flood, she said, had swept their house clean away. But this wasn't clean. Water raged muddy brown, full of tumbling shapes torn from buildings. Nor did it pass with the quiet swish of a broom over a floor. Its predatory rumble signaled satisfaction as it feasted on its kill. What did the flood ripped from his own business two floors below? He could only imagine. The old oak door with its rich red grain highlighted by dark swirling knots. The glass storefront with its old English script smashed into a million lethal shards. Splinters of wooden tables and chairs where once customers gathered for food and companionship. Cakes and cookies and pastries still warm from the oven, dissolved in the night, their commingled aromas diffused on the wind. He might have wept had he seen it. Tomorrow he would see and weep. Tonight he could only watch the street boil. Behind him, a whisper of movement announced his wife. She came into the living room from the kitchen, dinner over, dishes done, and stood beside him. She took his hand in hers. They watched together, silent, he tall and slim, she short and slim, while water rushed down the street and sirens wailed in the distance and frightened people cried in the terrible night. Will it be okay, she asked. He shook his head, not knowing. She squeezed his hand. Yes, he decided, this is what insurance is for. Insurance can't fix everything, Jim. No. Denise lifted her round face to him. A lock of her long, dark hair crossed it, and he pushed it back from her hard eyes. Water is a shovel, she told him. It digs up everything. It crossed his mind, too, this everything of which she spoke, a dangerous secret whose exposure she feared. But a torrent of decades had rushed by. It could hardly matter anymore. The here and now filled his thoughts. Lost business, lost customers, lost heritage. His bakery was more than a store. It was four generations of fairings. James Faring IV hoped someday to pass it to James Faring V, little as his son cared. In time, maybe, James the Younger would remember his heritage and the bakery would be waiting. This wasn't the first Ellicott City flood, nor would it be the last. They would rebuild, reopen, recover. People always had, always would. Say something, she said. Denise regarded, Jim regarded Denise with dull eyes. When she was 27, she had been the most beautiful woman in the world. Now at twice that age, he didn't know. She wasn't unpleasant to look at, but as she gained in years, she'd lost something else. The sparkle had slipped away when he wasn't looking, leaving her cold, cynical, the self-appointed watchdog of the modest fairing empire. He took her into his arms and held her close. I wouldn't worry about it, he whispered in her ear. Together, they stared into the darkness. She watched the water. He watched the water. I would, she said. 
Years later, when his grandchildren, Susie and Andrew, were old enough to understand the word, Detective Lieutenant Rick Culler would describe the night of Tuesday, May 30th, as one that should have been euthanized. The flood was bad. What it unearthed was worse. And to add insult to injury, he ended up soaked, bruised, battered, and only by the grace of God alive. He began at the scene of a gun shop burglary. The call came as he trundled home in his F-150 following a day of senseless, if non-lethal, violence and its attendant paperwork. Crime never took a day off. That day, it had been a drug dealer shot in both kneecaps by a disgruntled client, a knifing at the Columbia Town Center or a botched fast food order, and a betrayed girlfriend tracking down her ex's lovers and inflicting heavy damage on their cars with a hammer. Heller was a bit sorry they'd caught her, but proud that his team had scored 100% that day. Every perp had been apprehended by the time he left for home. But May 30th wasn't over. What do they want with me, he demanded of the dispatcher. Even with the current understaffing, routine burglary shouldn't be a job for an off-the-clock lieutenant. Jerry wants you, the dispatcher said, as though some crime, as though crime scene technician Jerry Franklin outranked them all. Why? That's above my pay grade, lieutenant. I just make the calls. Yeah, sorry. 10-4. On my way. Keller rerouted himself. He'd been looking forward to phoning his son Jason and the grandkids that evening. It had been a couple weeks since he talked with them, and he was feeling the distance. Fortunately, they lived two time zones west in Denver. With luck, he'd wrap this up quickly and catch them before Belinda tucked the kids in bed. His destination was the Lodge, a store west of Ellicott City just off, off US Route 40. It was hard to miss. A bright green sign upon which a 12-point buck pranced identified the standalone building. A nearly dead light flickered inside the sign, supplying an illusion of movement. Fast food restaurants, a grocery store, and a pet supply store clustered nearby, screened from the gun shop by stands of tall trees. Maybe they were embarrassed to have the lodge for a neighbor. It stood alone, like the last kid to be picked for a team. He parked and went in, noting in passing the bars on the windows, the deadbolt on the front door, the alarm system controls on the wall inside. The storefront felt surprisingly roomy. The goods were arranged along the walls and windows, leaving the middle open. Glass kit and display cases served as counters on three sides. Racks of guns, hunting bows, and fishing rods lined the walls behind the counters. Apparel and other merchandise hung on clothing racks before the windows. The two responding officers huddled over one of the display cases, talking shop with the lone employee on duty. A sleek semi-automatic handgun lay on the counter while the employee pointed out its features with a meaty index finger. When Peller entered, the officers snapped to something like tension. The employee tugged his untucked button-down shirt into position over his stocky frame. His be heavily bearded, he didn't look like someone to be messed with, but his expression was that of a child caught stealing cookies. Peller introduced himself. Chuck Faring, the big man said. I'm the owner. What's the story, Mr. Faring? Faring waggled a thumb toward a, a curtain covering the storeroom door. Someone broke in and made off with a dozen weapons or so, mostly handguns, a, cousin rifle, a couple rifles. When did this happen? About an hour ago, I was helping a customer. I heard a noise and went back to check. By the time I got there, they were gone. The senior officer, David Moles, by his name tag, south of the border by his face and accent, likewise motioned at the curtain. The back door was unlocked and a few boxes knocked over. That's probably what Mr. Faring heard. Faring cleared his throat and looked at the gun on the counter. Heller could well imagine his embarrassment. Barred windows, dead bolts, alarms, and the burglars just strolled in. When was that door last used? Four days ago, Faring said, when we got a delivery. An open and shut case, Peller quipped to himself. They opened the door, took what they wanted, and shut it again. An all too common story. Why weren't people more careful? What about your customer? Did they hear the noise? Faring shrugged. He heard it. I guess he got tired of waiting. He left before I got back. How long did that take? About 10 minutes. When I realized stuff was missing, I checked over everything. Trampling any, any evidence. Did you know the customer? Faring shook his head. Peller figured, figured it better than even odds the customer had been a distraction, allowing the burglars to work unnoticed. He turned to the officers. So why am I here? Something unusual turn up? Molis made that thumb gesture again. The tech is working the scene now, sir. And yeah, we found something unusual. The officers glanced at each other as though sorting out who should spring the surprise on him. Such as? There's a note. She bagged it for you. After 30 years on the force, little surprised Peller anymore, but sometimes a sight, sound, or comment triggered a disquiet in him. He'd learned to pay attention to that feeling. What kind of note? A sort of manifesto. It basically says, Molez looked at Faring as though willing him to fish the, finish the explanation, but Faring wasn't inclined. He gazed out the storefront and chewed his bottom lip. 
says what, officer? Your people will die. That's the gist of it. All your people will die. Thank you. Okay. So that's fantastic. And so please unmute yourselves and let's make some noise again for Dale Lehman and a day for bones. Certainly sounds like it. it sounds like quite a, a desperate situation, actually. Thank you. Right. So um, finally, I will wind up the, the session with a reading from the Zardoth Imperative <coughs> Clanship. And we're still on chapters nine and ten. So I managed to get three readings out of it. Um, the title of which is The Battle for the Bekel. And we pick up from uh, the reading in September. Uh, so at the end of the last session, um, Hardy Brencher had just arrived in Duras labor camp and he's just told the humans, Declaney and Zardothy prisoners that there will be a raid by Zardothy ships on the mine and steelworks. When will this happen, Monsieur Brencher? Edith asked. Tonight. But if the raid happens, they'll kill us anyway, the Declaney leader said. The Kiai will have to kill us. Wouldn't it be better to be live slaves? We, Hardy indicated all the humans and I are, are here so that you don't have to be slaves anymore. You, Declaney, Zardathi, he explained why they'd come to Declaine. He scanned the compound and noted that the Kiai sentries had just changed. But there were relatively few of them. Will they be suspicious if we get everyone together? Yes, said the Declaney leader. It'd be better if you could speak to each group in turn. I'm Gervisht, leader of the Declaney. These are my lieutenants, Sivaro, my wife, and Rathelmer, my son. I can organize the Declaney here into a group, but I'm worried about what will happen afterwards. When the raid takes place, they'll know it wasn't just an industrial dispute. Hardy introduced himself and coughed again. <coughs> so we have to be ready to rush them and all of us, Declaney, Human, Zardothi, we've got to work together. How? The Kiai have disruptors. Hardy remembered the guards' conversation on board the shuttle. Have you ever wondered what they really think of all this? He waved a hand around the compound. We might be able to get them to come in with us. I bet they're not keen, that keen to be the slaves of the Voth. Yes, but they're scared of them. So am I, but it won't stop me. Hardy glanced over at the guards again. Meantime, if they ask what we're up to, we have the perfect excuse for congregating here, Robert's illness. We're concerned about him. We found out you declaiming are healers and asked for advice. He coughed <coughs> and lowered his voice. Let's decide which form our industrial disobedience will take. Placards, Josie suggested. We can make placards and march up and down with them. With what? Sivaro looked around the compound. We don't have anything to make them from. The marching's a good idea, but there's no paper or spare fabric to use. Hardy wiped his eyes. Is suffering badly from the polluted atmosphere. And our scripts are all different. He indicated the Declaney, the Zardothi, and the small groups, group of humans. But we could chant slogans. Okay, Aya said, but are we demanding pay? No, more food, Edith said. That would sound more reasonable, as if it is something we have thought about for a long time. How about if we chant more food for work, Josie said, or even fair food for work, Hardy added. It'll give them something to think about and provide a distraction so they don't expect the raid. We could stop the Kiai from entering the compound, Edith suggested, although not at mealtimes. Good one, Hardy agreed. Gervish put his hand on Hardy's elbow. Do you know what, human? I like your ideas, strange as they are. Hardy grinned. I'll like yours even more if you can fix Robert's health after this is all over. What's the best time to start the march? When the next shift is due to return to the mine and the plant, Josie said, it's mealtime too. Haftar will attack then, Hardy said. We should eat first, then protest, Gervish, su Gervish suggested. 
Come with me and I'll get my people organised. Good, Hardy declared. Later, he sank down onto the ground after his latest coughing fit. I need to conserve energy for the protest march, he thought. He watched as Edith checked Robert's oxygen supply. She looked worried as she got up. Ayah and his father Lomar had joined them after they'd told the Zardathi group what would happen. Eddie and his family were with them. Josie was nowhere to be seen. Hardy lay back and closed his eyes. Just give me one back. A while later, he became aware of someone moving on the ground beside him. He opened his eyes. Sorry, Hardy, Josie said. I didn't mean to wake you. You must be tired if you're dozing. I just wanted to, to, it's fine, Josie. I understand. It's a bit scary for you. I'm here. She nodded and laid her head against his shoulder. How do you think the Kiai will react to our industrial disobedience? Uh, are we going to die, Hardy? Yep, yeah, probably, he sighed. But we have to try this. I'm scared, she shivered. Hold me, Hardy. I don't want to die without you ever holding me again. Me neither. And his arm slipped around her in such a natural way that, and met no resistance that he wondered why they hadn't been together all this time. After the evening food ration, Chabu Restique was hard at work on a new rotor in his office in the guard's accommodation at the side of the compound when one of the guards banged on the door. He didn't wait for Chabu to invite him in. The door burst open and came off its hinges as the guard marched over and saluted him. What's the meaning of this? Chabu demanded as he got to his feet. Sir, sir, the prisoners are... He hesitated, still gasping for breath, <laughs> protesting. Sir, what do you mean protesting? We think they're protesting. They say there's not enough food. The guard paused to draw in a gulp of filtered air and gagged on it. <coughs> sir, look outside, sir. Chabu crossed to the door and tapped it with a forefinger. You better get this fixed on the double heel, observed, or we'll lose the filtered air in here. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. The guard went to a cupboard and returned with the screwdriver. Chabu stepped over the threshold, called for Trask, and surveyed the compound. It seemed fuller than usual, and as the guard had said, the prisoners, Zardathi, Declaney, and the new group of humans alike, and even the few renegade Kiai, marched around in a ragged circle. The noise outside was indescribable. All four groups of prisoners chanted the same phrases over and over again in their own languages. And after each chant, the prisoners raised one clenched fist in unison and shouted, fair food for work on the black. Aftar watched as the Simtank's external camera feed skimmed over the night dark desert. In the background, a faint hum from the box the humans had left told him the stealth kit worked to conceal them. There, Baron Gacht, Aftar's navigator, pointed into the sim tank at a spot that looked empty. That's five sets of coordinates now. The Voss are digging the heart out of this planet. They always do. How convenient that they don't have hands to get dirty. Have you identified the coordinates that Bukel sent us, Erin? Her smile was grim. Coordinates identified. Increased magnification. Aftar peered into his sim tank, where a series of images of increasing magnification stacked on each other. The installation was solitary among the rolling sand dunes. Beside a block of masonry, a tall chimney reached up into the sky. At some distance, a huge hole yawned in the desert. There was no sign of activity there. But the compound nearby teemed with people. Increased magnification. Now, Aftar could see that people marched in a circle inside the compound. He increased the magnification a couple of times to identify the leaders of the march. It's Hardy Brencher. He's there. He's done it. Start the attack. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, thank you.
right so right a few other things to tell you and i've missed my page okay so i hope all of you fab listeners enjoyed all of that and many thanks to all our lovely authors and readers that's chico chuck david marise and dale for joining me And thank you so much to our lovely friends and family studio audience for joining us and supporting our readers today. If you'd like to stay and join our chat with the authors after, you, after we finish, you are most welcome to join us. That part will not be recorded or streamed, so if you put your video off, you can safely put it back on once I stop the stream and video recording. Authors, if you yeah. haven't yet done so, here's a reminder to please include links to your books in the chat or send them to me afterwards and I'll post them on my timeline, in the finger on the pulse, on my LinkedIn, on my YouTube channel, Helen Claire Gould, and on my website, www.zardoth.com. Do include prices, ISBNs or ASINs, stockists, national, international and local, and your websites too. This has been Helen Claire Gould. Uh, comparing fiction fix online and bringing together um, both new and established writers in various fiction genres to your attention. Thank you so much for joining us. So the next fiction fix online is on Sunday the 20th of November at 4 p.m. till about 5 to 10 p.m. November is full and I have had to make the decision to shelve Fiction Fix Online for a few months at least, so I, I can publish my supersized stories of space mercenaries, uh, but it will be back in 2023, although it may be the autumn season that I pick up with. But please still get in touch with me on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Goodreads me messaging, or by email to ask for a slot. So bye till the 20th of November. And let's 